14. The Grail Dynasty. On the basis of the Nag Hammadi scrolls alone, the possibility of a bloodline descended directly from Jesus gained considerable plausibility for us. Certain of the so called Gnostic Gospels enjoyed as great a claim to veracity as the books of the New Testament. As a result, the things to which they explicitly or implicitly bore witness a substitute on the cross, a continuing dispute between Peter and the Magdalene, a marriage between the Magdalene and Jesus, the birth of a son of the Son of Man could not be dismissed out of hand, however controversial they might be. We were dealing with history, not theology. And history in Jesus' time was no less complex, multifaceted and oriented towards practicalities than it is today. The feud in the Nag Hammadi scrolls between Peter and the Magdalene apparently testified to precisely the conflict we had hypothesis the conflict between the adherents of the message and the adherents to the bloodline. But it was the former who eventually emerged triumphant to shape the course of Western civilization. Given their increasing monopoly of learning, communication and documentation, there remained little evidence to suggest that Jesus's family ever existed. And there was still less to establish a link between that family and the Merovingian dynasty. Not that the adherents of the message had things entirely their own way. If the first two centuries of Christian history were plagued by irrepressible heresies, the centuries that followed were even more so. While orthodoxy consolidated itself theologically under Irenaeus, politically under Constantine the heresies continued to proliferate on a hitherto unprecedented scale. However much they differed in theological details, most of the major heresies shared certain crucial factors. Most of them were essentially Gnostic or Gnostic-influenced, repudiating the hierarchical structure of Rome and extolling the supremacy of personal illumination over blind faith. Most of them were also in one sense or anther, dualist, regarding good and evil less as mundane ethical problems than as issues of ultimately cosmic import. Finally most of them concurred in regarding Jesus as mortal, born by a natural process of conception a prophet, divinely inspired perhaps, but not intrinsically divine, who died definitively on the cross, or who never died on the cross at all. In their emphasis on Jesus's humanity, many of the heresies referred back to the august authority of St. Paul, who had spoken of Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, Romans 1 verse 3. Perhaps the most famous and profoundly radical of the heresies was Manichaeanism essentially a fusion of Gnostic Christianity with skeins of earlier Zoroastrian and Mithraic traditions. It was founded by an individual named Mani, who was born near Baghdad in AD 214 to a family related to the Persian royal house. As a youth Mani was introduced by his father into an unspecified mystical sect probably Gnostic which emphasized asceticism and celibacy, practiced baptism, and wore white robes. Around AD 240 Mani commenced to propagate his own teachings and, like Jesus, was renowned for his spiritual healing and exorcisms. His followers proclaimed him the new Jesus and even credited him with a virgin birth a prerequisite for deities at the time. He was also known as Savior, Apostle, Illuminator, Lord, Raiser of the Dead, Pilot, and Helmsman. The last two designations are especially suggestive, for they are interchangeable with not near, the official title assumed by the Grand Master of the Prior de Chaun. According to later Arab historians Mani produced many books in which he claimed to reveal secrets Jesus had mentioned only obscurely and obliquely. He regarded Zarathustra, Buddha and Jesus as his forerunners and declared that he, like them, had received essentially the same enlightenment from the same source. His teachings consisted of a Gnostic dualism wedded to an imposing and elaborate cosmological edifice. Pervading everything was the universal conflict of light and darkness, and the most important battlefield for these two opposed principles was the human soul. Like the later Cathars, Mani espoused the doctrine of reincarnation. Like the Cathars too he insisted on an initiate class, an illuminated elect. He referred to Jesus as the son of the widow a phrase subsequently appropriated by Freemasonry. At the same time he declared Jesus to be mortal or, if divine at all, divine only in a symbolic or metaphorical sense, by virtue of enlightenment. And Mani, like Basilides, maintained that Jesus did not die on the cross, but was replaced by a substitute. In AD 276, by order of the king, Mani was imprisoned, flayed to death, skinned and decapitated, 
and, perhaps to preclude a resurrection, his mutilated body was put on public display. His teachings, however, only gained impetus from his martyrdom, and among his later adherents, at least for a time, was St. Augustine. With extraordinary rapidity, Manichaeanism spread throughout the Christian world. Despite ferocious endeavors to suppress it, it managed to survive, to influence later thinkers, and to persist up to the present day. In Spain and in the south of France Manichaean schools were particularly active. By the time of the Crusades these schools had forged links with other Manichaean sects from Italy and Bulgaria. It now appears unlikely that the Cathars were an offshoot of the Bulgarian Bogomils. On the contrary, the most recent research suggests that the Cathars arose from Manichaean schools long established in France. In any case the Albigensian Crusade was essentially a crusade against Manichaeanism, and despite the most assiduous efforts of Rome, the word Manichaean has survived to become an accepted part of our language and vocabulary. In addition to Manichaeanism, of course, there were numerous other heresies. Of them all, it was the heresy of Arius which posed the most dangerous threat to Orthodox Christian doctrine during the first thousand years of its history. Arius was a presbyter in Alexandria around 318 and died in 335. His dispute with Orthodoxy was quite simple and rested on a single premise that Jesus was wholly mortal, was in no sense divine, and in no sense anything other than an inspired teacher. By positing a single omnipotent and supreme God a God who did not incarnate in the flesh and did not suffer humiliation and death at the hands of his creation Arius effectively embedded Christianity in an essentially Judaic framework. And he may well, as a resident of Alexandria, have been influenced by Judaic teachings there the teachings of the Edianites, for example. At the same time the supreme God of Arianism enjoyed immense appeal in the West. As Christianity came to acquire increasingly secular power, such a god became increasingly attractive. Kings and potentates could identify with such a god more readily than they could with a meek, passive deity who submitted without resistance to martyrdom and issued contact with the world. Although Arianism was condemned at the Council of Nicaea in 325, Constantine had already been sympathetic towards it and became more so at the end of his life. On his death, his son and successor, Constantius, became unabashedly Arian, and under his auspices councils were convened which drove Orthodox church leaders into exile. By 360 Arianism had all but displaced Roman Christianity. And though it was officially condemned again in 381, it continued to thrive and gain adherents. When the Merovingians rose to power during the 5th century, virtually every bishopric in Christendom was either Arian or vacant. Among the most fervent devotees of Arianism were the Goths, who had been converted to it from paganism during the 4th century. The Suevi, the Lombards, the Alans, the Vandals, the Burgundians, and the Ostrogoths were all Arian. So were the Visigoths who, when they sacked Rome in 480, spared Christian churches. If the early Merovingians, prior to Clovis, were at all receptive to Christianity, it would have been the Arian Christianity of their immediate neighbors, the Visigoths and Burgundians. Under Visigoth auspices, Arianism became the dominant form of Christianity in Spain, the Pyrenees, and what is now southern France. If Jesus's family did indeed find refuge in Gaul, their overlords, by the 5th century, would have been the Arian Visigoths. Under the Arian regime, the family is not likely to have been persecuted. It would probably have been highly esteemed and might well have intermarried with Visigoth nobility before its subsequent intermarriage with the Franks to produce the Merovingians. And with Visigoth patronage and protection, it would have been secure against all threats from Rome. It is thus not particularly surprising that unmistakably Semitic names Bera, for instance occur among Visigoth aristocracy and royalty. Dagobert II married a Visigoth princess whose father was named Bera. The name Bera recurs repeatedly in the Visigoth Merovingian family tree descended from Dagobert II and Sigisbert IV. The Roman Church is said to have declared that Dagobert's son had converted to Arianism, and it would not be very extraordinary if he had done so. Despite the pact between the Church and Clovis, the Merovingians had always been sympathetic to Arianism. One of Clovis's grandsons, Chilperic, made no secret of his Arian proclivities. If Arianism was not inimical to Judaism, neither was it to Islam, which rose so meteorically in the 7th century. 
The Aryan view of Jesus was quite in accord with that of the Quran. In the Quran Jesus is mentioned no less than 35 times, under a number of impressive appellations including Messenger of God and Messiah. At no point however, is he regarded as anything other than a mortal prophet, a forerunner of Muhammad and a spokesman for a single supreme God. And like Basilides and Mani, the Quran maintains that Jesus did not die on the cross, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but they thought they did. 3. The Quran itself does not elaborate on this ambiguous statement, but Islamic commentators do. According to most of them, there was a substitute generally, though not always, supposed to have been Simon of Cyrene. Certain Muslim writers speak of Jesus hiding in a niche of a wall and watching the crucifixion of a surrogate which concurs with the fragment already quoted from the Nag Hammadi scrolls. Judaism and the Merovingians. It is worth noting the tenacity, even in the face of the most vigorous persecution, with which most of the heresies and especially Arianism insisted on Jesus's mortality and humanity. But we found no indication that any of them necessarily possessed any first-hand knowledge of the premise to which they so persistently adhered. Still less was there any evidence, apart from the Nag Hammadi scrolls, to suggest their awareness of a possible bloodline. It was possible, of course, that certain documents did exist documents akin to the Nag Hammadi scrolls, perhaps even genealogies and archives. The sheer virulence of Roman persecution might well suggest a fear of such evidence and a desire to ensure that it would never see the light. But if that was the case, Rome would appear to have succeeded. The heresies then provided us with no decisive confirmation of a connection between Jesus's family and the Merovingians, who appeared on the world stage some four centuries later. For such confirmation we were obliged to look elsewhere back to the Merovingians themselves. At first glance the evidence, such as it was, seemed to be meager. We had already considered the legendary birth of Merovi, for example child of two fathers, one of whom was a mysterious aquatic creature from across the sea and guessed that this curious fable might have been intended simultaneously to reflect and conceal a dynastic alliance or intermarriage. But while the fish symbolism was suggestive, it was hardly conclusive. Similarly the subsequent pact between Clovis and the Roman Church made considerably more sense in the light of our scenario, but the pact itself did not constitute concrete evidence. And while the Merovingian royal blood was credited with a sacred, miraculous, and divine nature, it was not explicitly stated anywhere that this blood was in fact Jesus's. In the absence of any decisive or conclusive testimony, we had to proceed cautiously. We had to evaluate fragments of circumstantial evidence and try to assemble these fragments into a coherent picture. And we had first to determine whether there were any uniquely Judaic influences on the Merovingians. Certainly the Merovingian kings do not seem to have been anti-Semitic. On the contrary they seem to have been not merely tolerant, but downright sympathetic to the Jews in their domains and this despite the assiduous protests of the Roman Church. Mixed marriages were a frequent occurrence. Many Jews, especially in the South, possessed large landed estates. Many of them owned Christian slaves and servants. And many of them acted as magistrates and high-ranking administrators for their Merovingian lords. On the whole the Merovingian attitude towards Judaism seems to have been without parallel in Western history prior to the Lutheran Reformation. The Merovingians themselves believed their miraculous power to be vested, in large part, in their hair, which they were forbidden to cut. Their position on this matter was identical to that of the Nazarites in the Old Testament, of whom Samson was a member. There is much evidence to suggest that Jesus was also a Nazarite. According to both early church writers and modern scholars his brother, St. James, indisputably was. In the Merovingian royal house, and in the families connected with it, there were a surprising number of specifically Judaic names. Thus, in 577, a brother of King Clotaire II was named Samson. Subsequently one Myron the Levite was Count of Besselu and Bishop of Gerona. One Count of Roussillo was named Solomon, and another Solomon became King of Brittany. There was an Abbot Elisachar a variant of Eliezer and Lazarus. And the very name Merovi would seem to be of Middle Eastern derivation. Judaic names became increasingly prominent through dynastic marriages between the Merovingians and the Visigoths. Such names figure in Visigoth nobility and royalty, 
and it is possible that many so-called Visigoth families were in fact Judaic. This possibility gains further credence from the fact that chroniclers would frequently use the words Goth and Jew interchangeably. The south of France and the Spanish marches the region known as Septimania in Merovingian and Carolingian times contained an extremely large Jewish population. This region was also known as Gothi or Gothia, and its Jewish inhabitants were thus often called Goths in error which may, on occasion, have been deliberate. By dint of this error, Jews could not be identified as such, save perhaps by specific family names. Thus Dagobert's father-in-law was named Bera, which could be a Semitic name, it means son in Aramaic. And Bera's sister was married to a member of a family named Levi. Granted, names and a mystical attitude towards one's hair were not necessarily a solid basis on which to establish a connection between the Merovingians and Judaism. But there was another fragment of evidence which was somewhat more persuasive. The Merovingians were the royal dynasty of the Franks of Teutonic tribe which adhered to Teutonic tribal law. In the late 5th century this law, codified and couched in a Roman framework, became known as Salic law. In its origins however, Salic law was ultimately Teutonic tribal law and predated the advent of Roman Christianity in Western Europe. During the centuries that followed it continued to stand in opposition to the ecclesiastical law promulgated by Rome. Throughout the Middle Ages it was the official secular law of the Holy Roman Empire. As late as the Lutheran Reformation the German peasantry and knighthood included, in their grievances against the church, the latter's disregard for traditional Salic law. There is one entire section of the Salic law title 45, De Migrantibus which has consistently puzzled scholars and commentators and been the source of incessant legal debate. It is a complicated section of stipulations and clauses pertaining to circumstances whereby itinerants may establish residence and be accorded citizenship. What is curious about it is that it is not Teutonic in origin, and writers have been driven to postulate bizarre hypotheses to account for its inclusion in the Salic Code. Only recently however, it has been discovered that this section of the Salic Code derives directly from Judaic law. More specifically, it can be traced back to a section in the Talmud. It can thus be said that Salic law, at least in part, issues directly from traditional Judaic law. And this in turn suggests that the Merovingians under whose auspices Salic law was codified were not only versed in Judaic law, but had access to Judaic texts. The Principality in Septimania Such fragments were provocative, but they provided only tenuous support for our hypothesis that a bloodline descended from Jesus existed in the south of France, that this bloodline intermarried with the Merovingians, and that the Merovingians, in consequence, were partly Judaic. But while the Merovingian epoch failed to provide us with any conclusive evidence for our hypothesis, the epoch which immediately followed it did. By means of this retroactive evidence our hypothesis suddenly became tenable. We had already explored the possibility of the Merovingian bloodline surviving after being deposed from its thrones by the Carolingians. In the process we had encountered an autonomous principality that existed in the south of France for a century and a half a principality whose most famous ruler was Gillem de Gellone. Gillem was one of the most revered heroes of his age. He was also the protagonist of the Willeham by Wolfram von Eschenbach and is said to have been associated with the Grail family. It was in Gillem and his background that we found some of our most surprising and exciting evidence. At the apex of his power Gillem de Gellone included among his domains northeastern Spain, the Pyrenees, and the region of southern France known as Septimania. This area had long contained a large Jewish population. During the 6th and 7th centuries this population had enjoyed extremely cordial relations with its Visigoth overlords, who espoused Aryan Christianity so much so, in fact, that mixed marriages were common and the words Goth and Jew were often used interchangeably. By 711, however, the situation of the Jews in Septimania and northeastern Spain had sadly deteriorated. By that time Dagobert II had been assassinated and his lineage driven into hiding in the raises the region including and surrounding Rennes-le-Chateau. And while collateral branches of the Merovingian bloodline still nominally occupied the throne to the north, the only real power resided in the hands of the so-called mayors of the palace the Carolingian usurpers who, with the sanction and support of Rome, set about establishing their own dynasty. By that time, too, the Visigoths had themselves converted to Roman Christianity 
and begun to persecute the Jews in their domains. Thus, when Visigoth Spain was overrun by the Moors in 711, the Jews eagerly welcomed the invaders. Under Muslim rule the Jews of Spain enjoyed a thriving existence. The Moors were gracious to them, often placing them in administrative charge of captured cities like Cordoba, Granada and Toledo. Jewish commerce and trade were encouraged and attained a new prosperity. Judaic thought coexisted, side by side, with that of Islam, and the two cross-fertilized each other. And many towns including Cordoba, the Moorish capital of Spain, were predominantly Jewish in population. At the beginning of the 8th century the Moors crossed the Pyrenees into Septimania, and from 720 until 759 while Dagobert's grandson and great-grandson continued their clandestine existence in the raises Septimania was in Islamic hands. Septimania became an autonomous Moorish principality, with its own capital at Narbonne and owing only nominal allegiance to the Emir of Córdoba. And from Narbonne the Moors of Septimania began to strike northwards, capturing cities as deep into Frankish territory as lions. The Moorish advance was checked by Charles Martel, mayor of the palace and grandfather of Charlemagne. By 738 Charles had driven the Moors back to Narbonne, to which he then laid siege. Narbonne however defended by both Moors and Jews proved impregnable, and Charles vented his frustration by devastating the surrounding countryside. By 752 Charles's son, Pepin, had formed alliances with local aristocrats, thereby bringing Septimania fully under his control. Narbonne, however, continued to resist, withstanding a seven-year-long siege by Pepin's forces. The city was a painful thorn in Pepin's side, at a time when it was most urgent for him to consolidate his position. He and his successors were acutely sensitive to charges of having usurped the Merovingian throne. To establish a claim to legitimacy, he forged dynastic alliances with surviving families of the Merovingian royal blood. To further validate his status he arranged for his coronation to be distinguished by the biblical rite of anointing whereby the church assumed the prerogative of creating kings. But there was another aspect to the ritual of anointing as well. According to scholars, anointing was a deliberate attempt to suggest that the Frankish monarchy was a replica, if not actually a continuation, of the Judaic monarchy in the Old Testament. This, in itself, is extremely interesting. For why would Pepin the usurper want to legitimize himself by means of a biblical prototype? Unless the dynasty he deposed the Merovingian dynasty had legitimized itself by precisely the same means. In any case Pepin was confronted by two problems the tenacious resistance of Narbonne, and the matter of establishing his own legitimate claim to the throne by referring to biblical precedent. As Professor Arthur Zuckerman of Columbia University has demonstrated, he resolved both problems by a pact in 759 with Narbonne's Jewish population. According to this pact, Pepin would receive Jewish endorsement for his claim to a biblical succession. He would also receive Jewish aid against the Moors. In return he would grant the Jews of Septimania a principality and a king of their own. In 759 the Jewish population of Narbonne turned suddenly upon the city's Muslim defenders, slaughtered them, and opened the gates of the fortress to the besieging Franks. Shortly thereafter, the Jews acknowledged Pepin as their nominal overlord and validated his claim to a legitimate biblical succession. Pepin, in the meantime, kept his part of the bargain. In 768 a principality was created in Septimania a Jewish principality which paid nominal allegiance to Pepin, but was essentially independent. A ruler was officially installed as king of the Jews. In the romances he is called Amory. According to existing records however, he seems, on being received into the ranks of Frankish nobility, to have taken the name Theodoric or Thierry. Theodoric or Thierry was the father of Gillam de Gellone. And he was recognized by both Pepin and the Caliph of Baghdad, as the seed of the royal house of David. As we had already discovered, modern scholars were uncertain about Theodoric's origins and background. According to most researchers he was of Merovingian descent. According to Arthur Zuckerman he is said to have been a native of Baghdad in Exilarch, descended from Jews who had lived in Babylon since the Babylonian captivity. It is also possible however, that the Exilarch from Baghdad was not Theodoric. It is possible that the Exilarch came from Baghdad to consecrate Theodoric, 
and subsequent records confuse the two. Professor Zuckerman mentions a curious assertion that the Western Exilarchs were of purer blood than those in the East. Who were the Western Exilarchs, if not the Merovingians? Why would an individual of Merovingian descent be acknowledged as king of the Jews, ruler of a Jewish principality and seat of the royal house of David, unless the Merovingians were indeed partly Judaic? Following the church's collusion in Dagobert's assassination and its betrayal of the pact ratified with Clovis, the surviving Merovingians may well have repudiated all allegiance to Rome and returned to what was their former faith. Their ties to that faith would, in any case, have been strengthened by Dagobert's marriage to the daughter of an ostensibly Visigoth prince with the patently Semitic name of Bera. Theodoric, or Thierry, further consolidated his position, and Pepin's as well, by an expeditious marriage to the latter's sister Alda, the aunt of Charlemagne. In the years that followed the Jewish kingdom of Septimania enjoyed a prosperous existence. It was richly endowed with estates held in freehold from the Carolingian monarchs. It was even granted sizable tracts of church land despite the vigorous protests of Pope Stephen III and his successors. The son of Theodoric, king of the Jews of Septimania, was Guillem de Gellone, whose titles included Count of Barcelona, of Toulouse, of Auvergne and of Raises. Like his father Gillem was not only Merovingian, but also a Jew of royal blood. Royal blood acknowledged by the Carolingians, by the Caliph and, albeit grudgingly, by the Pope to be that of the House of David. Despite subsequent attempts to conceal it, modern scholarship and research have proved Gillem's Judaism beyond dispute. Even in the romances where he figures as Guillaume, Prince of Orange he is fluent in both Hebrew and Arabic. The device on his shield is the same as that of the Eastern Exilarchs the Lion of Judah, the tribe to which the House of David, and subsequently Jesus, belonged. He is nicknamed Hooknose. And even amidst his campaigns, he takes pains to observe the Sabbath and the Judaic Feast of the Tabernacles. As Arthur Zuckerman remarks, the chronicler who wrote the original report of the siege and fall of Barcelona recorded events according to the Jewish calendar, the commander of the expedition, Duke William of Narbonne and Toulouse conducted the action with strict observance of Jewish Sabbaths and holy days. In all of this, he enjoyed the full understanding and cooperation of King Louis. Guillaume de Gellone became one of the so-called peers of Charlemagne an authentic historical hero who, in the popular mind and tradition, ranked with such legendary figures as Roland and Olivier. When Charlemagne's son, Louis, was invested as emperor, it was Guillaume who placed the crown on his head. Louis is reported to have said, Lord William, it is your lineage that has raised up mine. It is an extraordinary statement, given that it is addressed to a man whose lineage so far as later historians are concerned would seem to be utterly obscure. At the same time Gillam was more than a warrior. Shortly before 792 he established an academy at Gellone, importing scholars and creating a renowned library, and Gellone soon became an esteemed center of Judaic studies. It is from just such an academy that the heathen Phlegitanes might have issued the Hebrew scholar descended from Solomon, who, according to Wolfman, confided the secret of the Holy Grail to Kayat of Provence. In 806 Gillam withdrew from active life, secluding himself in his academy. Here, around 812, he died, and the academy was later converted into a monastery, the now famous St. Gilhelm le Desert. Even before Gillam's death, however, Gellone had become one of the first known seats in Europe for the cult of the Magdalene which, significantly enough, flourished there concurrently with the Judaic Academy. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah and the royal house of David. The Magdalene is said to have carried the grail the Sangral or royal blood into France. And in the 8th century there was, in the south of France, a potentate of the tribe of Judah and the royal house of David, who was acknowledged as king of the Jews. He was not only a practicing Jew however. He was also a Merovingian. And through Wolfram von Eschenbach's poem, he and his family are associated with the Holy Grail, the seed of David. In later centuries assiduous attempts seem to have been made to expunge from the records all trace of the Jewish kingdom of Septimania. The frequent confusion of Goths and Jews seems indicative of this censorship but the censorship could not hope to be entirely successful. As late as 1143 Peter the Venerable of Cluny, in an address to Louis VII of France, condemned the Jews of Narbonne, 
who claimed to have a king residing among them. In 1144 a Cambridge monk, one Theobald, speaks of the chief princes and rabbis of the Jews who dwell in Spain, and assemble together at Narbonne where the royal seed resides. And in 1165-6 Benjamin of Tudela, a famous traveler and chronicler, reports that in Narbonne there are sages, magnates and princes at the head of whom is, a descendant of the house of David is stated in his family tree. But any seed of David residing in Narbonne by the 12th century was of less consequence than certain other seed living elsewhere. Family trees bifurcate, spread, subdivide and produce veritable forests. If certain descendants of Theodoric and Gillam de Gellone remained in Narbonne, there were others who over the intervening four centuries had attained more august domains. By the 12th century these domains included the most illustrious in Christendom Lorraine and the Frankish Kingdom of Jerusalem. In the 9th century the bloodline of Gillam de Gellone had culminated in the first Dukes of Aquitaine. It also became aligned with the Ducal House of Brittany. And in the 10th century a certain Hugues de Plantard nicknamed Long Nose, and a descendant of the bloodline of both Dagobert and Gillam de Gellone became the father of Eustache, first Count of Boulogne. Eustache's grandson was Godfroy de Bouillon, Duke of Lorraine and conqueror of Jerusalem. And from Godfroy there issued a dynasty and a royal tradition which, by virtue of being founded on the Rock of Shaun, was equal to those presiding over France, England and Germany. If the Merovingians were indeed descended from Jesus, then Godfroy Sion of the Merovingian blood royal had, in his conquest of Jerusalem, regained his rightful heritage. Godfroy and the subsequent House of Lorraine were, of course, nominally Catholic. To survive in a now Christianized world, they would have had to be. But their origins seem to have been known about in certain quarters at least. As late as the 16th century it is reported that Henri de Lorraine, Duke of Guise, on entering the town of Joinville in Champagne, was received by exuberant crowds. Among them, certain individuals are recorded to have chanted Hosanna Philio David, Hosanna to the Son of David. It is not perhaps insignificant that this incident is recounted in a modern history of Lorraine, printed in 1966. The work contains a special introduction by Otto von Habsburg who today is titular Duke of Lorraine and King of Jerusalem.